Welcome back, dear brothers and sisters. In the last episode, we saw God's claim on the firstborn, both humans and animals. The firstborn in Egypt had died. The gods of Egypt had always claimed the firstborn as their own. And now God claims the firstborn of Israel as his own. The firstborn of the sons of the Israelites had to be redeemed by silver. He wants the first from believers today also. Many Christians do not give him the first place. He, God claims our best, our very best. God claims the first in everything. Secondly, we discuss on the reminder of the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. This observance was to be passed from one generation to the other so that the people would always remember that God delivered them out of the land of Egypt. Thirdly, God did not lead the Israelites directly through the Philistines' land. The Israelites had just come out of slavery and they were not prepared for warfare. So God graciously took them through the wilderness. It was a longer route to the land, but it would spare them of any warfare. They would not have to face an enemy until they entered the land. They left Egypt in an orderly manner. Moses took the bonds of Joseph. And fourthly, the visible presence of God was with them in the desert. Though the desert weather fluctuated terribly with heat and cold, God had a provision of cloud by day and fire by night to keep His people safe and secured. Dear friends, welcome to another episode of Through the Bible. Let's witness today Satan's last attempt by Pharaoh to destroy Israel. And the mighty hand of God to deliver us even from the worst of situations. God bless you as you listen. Chapter 14 Pharaoh and his army pursue Israel Exodus 14, 1-2 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, over against Baal Zephon, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. It is impossible to locate these places definitely, but they were somewhere between the Nile River and the Red Sea. Exodus 14:3. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness bath shut them in. Pharaoh had spies watching the children of Israel. The movement of two and one half million people would be difficult to conceal anyway. Pharaoh expects the Israelites to move up the coastal route and through the land of the Philistines. When they head towards the wilderness, he thinks they are lost and do not know where they are going. God says that when he thinks they are trapped, he will pursue them. It is obvious that Pharaoh let the Israelites go reluctantly. God is not through with this man Pharaoh yet. Exodus 14.4 And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. You would think that the Egyptians had experienced enough disaster, but something even more profound is going to take place that will convince them. Exodus 14, 5-7 And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took six hundred chosen chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt, and captains over every one of them. The host of Egypt moved against the children of Israel with 600 chariots. You can imagine what that number of chariots could do to a poor, helpless, defenseless people. Especially women, children and cattle. They would make havoc and hash of them. Exodus 14, 8-10 And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, and his horsemen, and his army, and overtook them encamping by the sea, beside Phi Harheroth, before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. The Red Sea is ahead of the Israelites, and the host of Egypt are behind them. These poor defenseless people are caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. 
From a natural viewpoint, the Israelites are in a bad spot. Exodus 14.11 And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? This is a rather ironic statement, and I am sure it was even more so in that day. The great pyramids stood as monuments to the burial places of kings. Mummies were all over the place in Egypt. It was a great burying ground. The children of Israel were saying, Did you bring us all the way out into the wilderness to die because there was not room to bury us in the land of Egypt? The Israelites are sure they are going to be slaughtered out in the wilderness. Exodus 14.12 Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. The Israelites, when they were in the land of Egypt, cried out for deliverance. God provided the opportunity for them to leave, but the minute they were in danger, they wanted to return to Egypt. Now notice what God is going to do for His people. They are helpless and hopeless without the aid of God. If they are to be redeemed, God will have to do it. I wish we could get that objective viewpoint of ourselves today because we are just like the Israelites. If we go out with the astronauts to the moon and look down on this little earth of ours, we would see people lost in sin. Actually, our world is a pretty hopeless place, a great burying ground. In Romans 5.12, Paul tells us, Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Man has been on the march for over 5,000 years. Where is he marching to? Man is marching to the grave. It isn't pretty, but it is true. Man is the most colossal failure in God's universe. Look at these children of Israel. Unless God moves on their behalf, they are doomed. And you and I could never be redeemed unless God did it. Friends, redemption is the work of the Lord. Jonah said, Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah 2.9 King David made the same statement and that is the message of the New Testament. Exodus 14.13 And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will shew to you today. For the Egyptians whom we have seen today, he shall see them again no more, forever. The Lord will work in behalf of his people. All they have to do is accept and receive his salvation. They are to stand still and God will do the work. Remember, you can't lift a little finger to work out your salvation. All you have to do is accept what God has done for you. Exodus 14.14 14, The Lord shall fight for you and he shall hold your peace. God will bring salvation to his people and will bring the peace that comes from having sins forgiven. Exodus 14.15-16 And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. The Israelites are to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But when it is wrought, they are to lay hold of his instructions by faith. Their faith will be evidenced in whether or not they will go forward. Many natural explanations are offered as to how the children of Israel crossed the sea. First, I believe, it is well established by reputable, conservative historians and theologians that the exodus of Israel is a historical fact. First, I believe, it is well established by reputable, conservative historians and theologians that the exodus of Israel is a historical fact. The problem for most people comes in trying to figure out how they crossed the Red Sea. Some say that the wind blew the water back, but there was a wall of water on both sides of the path. Others say that some sort of a natural phenomenon rolled back the sea. Still others claim that an earthquake took place at the exact moment they were ready to cross the sea. The thing that must be faced here is that a miracle took place. You either accept it or you do not. God, by a miracle, opened the sea and the Israelites walked through it on dry ground. When the Israelites crossed the sea, they crossed to the other side dry shod. There was not even enough water for them to get their feet damp. It would be difficult to explain this apart from a direct miracle. Exodus 14.17 
and I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. Had you been at the water's edge when Pharaoh started to follow the children of Israel across the Red Sea, you would have said to him, I suppose that you recognize that you are doing this because your heart and the hearts of your people are hardened by God, and you really don't want to do it. I think Pharaoh and his army would have laughed at you and replied, We are chasing the Israelites because we want to. The fact is that God is forcing the Egyptians to do the thing that is in their hearts. Exodus 14, 18-21 And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by the strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. These are several things to take note of in this passage. First of all, the Egyptians mentioned in verse 18 are the people who are left back in the land of Egypt. Israel will cross safely to the other side of the Red Sea, and Pharaoh and his army will perish in the waters of that sea. And the Egyptians and the Egyptians left in the land will know that the God of the Israelites is the Lord. In verse 19, the angel of God is mentioned. I believe the angel of God was none other than the pre-incarnate Christ. It was God Himself who stood between the Egyptians and the Israelites. When a strong east wind came, it caused the sea to go back. A natural wind could never have made a wall of water on both sides. Exodus 14:22 to 25. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued, and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud, and troubled the host of the Egyptians, and took off their chariot wheels, and they drove them heavily. So that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. As God works out His plan to deliver His people, once again we see that He worked through the pillar of fire and the cloud, which I believe represent the Holy Spirit. They were led as the child of God should be led today, by the Spirit of God. It becomes clear to the Egyptians that what is happening to them is certainly supernatural. They want to retreat and escape the forces which are against them. Exodus 14, 26-28 And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. They remained not so much as one of them. This account needs close observation because it is a miracle. There is no natural way to explain what happened. Many conservative men, although they believe in the word of God and are saved by faith alone in Christ, try to explain the crossing of the Red Sea in some natural way. When you read this record, it is impossible to explain it naturally. God says it is a miracle, and you either take it or leave it. Exodus 14.29 But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right and on their left. This is a miracle. Twice now. This has been made clear to us. They walked on dry land through the midst of the sea. The waters were a wall on them on the left and on the right side. You cannot explain it on a natural basis. Exodus 14, 30-31 Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord, and believed the Lord, and his servant Moses. These two verses state the purpose of God's deliverance of Israel. At the beginning of their wilderness march, they saw the power of God when he delivered them by the blood out of Egypt. 
Now at the Red Sea, he demonstrates his power again by taking them safely across the sea, by destroying the Egyptians, pursuing them. God delivers his children by power. Let's close here, dear friends. What an experience for the Israelites to have seen the hand of God at work. We have the same God who is with us in spirit. I hope we desire to live by his power in our day-to-day lives, obeying his spirit and doing the things he wants us to. And also that we live a life that brings glory to God. Dear friends, as we come to a close, remember this. There could be times you feel trapped with no way out. Still, if God is on your side, you can still defeat the whole world. It was not the slaves fighting the mighty Egyptian army. It was God doing the fighting. Likewise, we should know when to cry for help and to whom to cry to. The salvation of the Lord is for those who trust Him. And from the day that God fights our staunchest and persistent enemies, one by one, we will never see them again. And it is only in the most difficult of times that God would divide up the sea for us to walk through. Dear friends, even as you fight your battles for holiness and faithfulness, love and forgiveness, for justice and peace, for health and well-being, for your children and family, for your church and community, for the saved and the lost. May God split tens of red seas so that all will see His power and glory. All praise be to God who does wondrous things for those who love Him, who trust Him and honor Him. God bless you and see you again in our next study of Through the Bible. Thank you.